being from Romania, I do not know much about hippies except what is presented in TV shows and movies. And they're always portrayed in a very positive light. They seem to advocate for a culture of peace and understanding. But once you actually look into this ideology, you realize that it's a very childish one, especially when you listen to one of the speeches from Ronald Reagan that says that we can have peace, we can have peace right now. That means complete surrender to the Soviet Union because the hippie movement happened during the Cold War. And basically what they would have wanted was for the Soviet Union to run amok, to do whatever they wanted in the world. And more interestingly, they wanted for the United States to disarm their nuclear weapons. In other words, they wanted the Soviet Union to be the only nuclear superpower in the world. So you can see why their childish ideology, if ever allowed to come to fruition, would have been very bad for the United States, and I would argue bad for the world, given the fact that Romania was under Soviet influence at the time. It wasn't a very nice uh, period of our history. But now I did find this uh, interview from the summer of 1968 in San Francisco. I understand this is exactly like Chaz, like the summer of love. If you guys remember that, that's how it was described by the mayor then. And uh, let's listen to some of these hippies actually speak. One of the first questions they'll ask is, what do you do? And so I say, I live. And they say, no, I mean, do you work or what? And I said, no, I just live. And they said, well, you must do something because their whole orientation is towards job, occupation. This is their whole life. Money. Money. Oh, God. Okay, so the thing is, a lot of people would call this gentleman a communist, but that is incorrect. If you read Karl Marx, even Karl says that if you can work, you should work. In fact, you have to work if you can work. The idea of a person that doesn't want to work and have other people provide for him, that is not a communist. That is an aristocrat, a slave owner. You, you are basically trying to suggest that you should be able to live on planet Earth without working. Now, imagine you happen to be on an island that's completely deserted, there's no other people around, and you choose not to work. What does nature do to you? Or, or you go to, I don't know, back in time, before there are any other people, and you refuse to work. What happens? Now, obviously, when you live in a society, you don't necessarily have to do the work that feeds yourself. Like, you, you don't have to actually raise the chickens, raise the plants, and then sacrifice those chickens, put them onto your pan and eat them, right? You can have other people do that for you. But the question is, what do you do for society? So the fact that we get money, the way that it's best explained is that when you grow up to be a teenager and you go and you help your neighbor by mowing his lawn, and then your neighbor gives you $20 for that. When you go to the store to buy milk, the store owner basically asks you, what did you do for your fellow men? And you say, okay, well, I helped my neighbor. And the store owner says, prove it. And you pull out the $20. Now, obviously, the communists are going to obfuscate this argument that they will say, well, yeah, but like some people are born in wealth, other people cannot mow the lawn. But that does not change the fact that while there are exceptions, generally speaking, at a societal level, this is what money actually is. It shows that you had something to trade in order to get something from someone else so that it's not slavery. And yeah, sure, some people are born in wealth, but that means that their parents provided more for society than it was actually needed to the point where they can afford to take some of that wealth and pass it to the next generation. So it's not really unfair when you think about it. Right? Like at one point, someone down that family line provided such a huge service for society that his wealth was so overflowing, they could pass it on. And sure, you know, some people did their wealth illegally, and there's a conversation to have about that. But the idea that you should just have people that can choose not to work, we saw what happened during COVID. That is the perfect example where everyone stays home, the government just prints money, and now you have inflation, now you have higher costs of living. And take into account that only happened because a few people in society, mostly middle class, had to stay at home for a couple of months, not even years. 
and look at the damage that did to, to the economy. Look, look at how the standards of living have fallen. And it's going to get even worse. Look at the inflation. Look how expensive things are. And this affects everyone. It affects even the people that did decide to work. It affects the lower class as well. It affects the working class. Just because a couple of uh, middle class decided to stay safe while everyone had to go out and work. Well, actually, the government decided for them. But still, right? So imagine if most people would take this decision where they're like, okay, well, we're not going to contribute to society, but we are going to take. I mean, this gentleman here, right, is wearing glasses, he's got his hair done, he's got a nice beard. Right? Like someone did this for him. He had to pay that person. So he had to get the money from someplace, whether he got it from his family, whether the government gave him welfare, it doesn't matter. Like someone had to work so that he can get these goods. One of the reasons I started this in the first place was because my parents were both very neurotic. And I realized this because I went to a psychiatrist for nine years. And uh, at the later stages of analysis, I realized just how neurotic and, and ill and in, in a world of illusion my parents were. And I decided that I was going to be the one in my, gen in my family to stop it. It was going to stop with my generation that I refused to pass this on to my children. I wish uh, I could show these hippies in 1968 San Francisco what their policies did in 2022. It's not San Francisco anymore, now it's Cat Francisco. Yeah, I guess uh, they did make a change. Now, I find it highly unlikely that both parents were mentally ill, because that's what she's trying to imply, yeah? Like neurotic, mentally ill. If you go to a psychologist, depending on the ideology that the psychologist learns from, because there's different schools of thought when you look at psychology. The one from the United States is completely different to the school of psychology practice in China, for example. They will have different definitions of what neurotic is. Like, for example, now being a cisgender, heteronormative, straight man is considered neurotic in the United States, but it's considered perfectly fine in China. So it really depends of the type of psychologist you go to and some of them can actually cause harm because their school of thought are not fit for reality or they have a different agenda uh, they, they try to social engineer society in the view of the people that are writing these texts that, that are part of these schools of thought and while they view that okay society will be better if we have less cisgender straight white men it may not be better for the individual that gets this type of advice and doesn't uh, find himself fulfilled in life, doesn't find himself uh, enjoying the company of a significant other that he would like. Now, what's interesting is that uh, the idea of the child rebelling against the parent, that has its roots in um, Mao's Chinese revolution. I mean, that, that's what it was applied at a broader scale, but it also happened in um, Lenin's revolution. It's a staple of communist revolution. It, it, it's not necessarily fixed to communism. The Nazis also did it to a certain degree. But almost every single communist revolution has this idea that the younger generation is actually smarter than the older generation. And now that we can look back in time, 1968 San Francisco, we can see the effects of that. The natural order of things is that the parent is wiser than the child. We even have a couple of Romanian expressions. The egg doesn't lecture the chicken. Uh, you do not teach your father how to have kids. All of these sayings represent the fact that the parents have more wisdom. And it makes sense because they have more life experience. But here comes the ideologues that will tell the children that no, you're actually way smarter than your parent. You're, you're God's gift to humanity. Uh, your parents are evil, destructive, uh, they're destroying the earth with senseless words, they're destroying the environment. You, the child, have the chance of being the pure generation. You're the one that can change things. Why do they do this? They do this because, first of all, elderly people are more conservative in nature and they do not accept revolutionary ideology as easy. And children are very easy to manipulate because they do not understand the arguments that they can use. They do not see the full picture. So they cannot contradict what the ideologue tells them. In this situation, when you tell children, it's like, hey, you know, the, the United States should 
go for world peace and they should take away their nuclear weapons. The young mind doesn't understand geopolitics. They do not understand the consequences of what would happen if Russia would control all the trade routes. They do not understand what would happen if all the nations in the world would be under Soviet influence and then they would start boycotting the United States. They do not understand what the concept of mutually assured destruction is and what it would mean for only the Soviet Union to have nuclear weapons. They do not understand any of this because they lack the maturity. At, the, at that time, they didn't have the internet to even learn about these things. But basically what I do see here is Tumblr. Like all of these people are part of Tumblr, except that social media use the same arguments and ideas fit for a more modern time. And they amplify them to the point where you have what you have today. I mean, if, if these people had Tumblr, if these people had Facebook, I think the past would have been much worse. Probably it would have been better in a way because people would have gone through the bad times and now they would have known to stay away from that. But anyway, right, let me know what you guys think. And as usual, I will see you in the comment section. We're doing the hardest work in the world because we're growing. We're trying to change. And that's a lot harder than staying in the same rut and going along year after year doing the same thing.